In this session, I'm going to talk to you about a resource pack that we've prepared for schools to support them in a whole school approach to including pupils with special educational needs. Now, the concept of, an inclusive, of a whole school approach to inclusion isn't new. I mean, if you look back to the late 80s, early 90s, when we really saw the drive at an international level for inclusion and the drive to move from a deficit medical model to a social model of disability in the education field, we saw a plethora of international declarations and frameworks that really uh, pushed countries and encouraged them to make sure that inclusive education was the underpinning principle of any, of any education system. And what we saw in response to that was a lot of countries engaging in developing new legislation and new frameworks and new policy uh, arena to try and ensure that schools better include children with special educational needs. But what really arose out of that then was a new discourse where people started to look at, well, what's the quality of that inclusion like? And what's the nature of that inclusion like? So engaging pupils and having pupils with special needs in a mainstream school doesn't automatically equate to inclusion. So for example, they may be in physically in the building, but are they engaging in academic and curricular activities, in social activities? And the discourse at the time was querying that around the 90s, um, where we were looking at issues and hearing um, looking at research evidence around children who are actually being excluded within mainstream environments. So it really challenged the education system to look at how that quality of inclusion is taking place within the mainstream settings in particular. And moving on then, you've probably often seen this quote before, this question before, what, was it an illusion? Was inclusion actually happening or was it just an illusion? And what very much became to the fore at the time was, in these schools, what was happening as people in schools were grasping with the concept of inclusion was, they were in the classrooms, but very often they were left to the responsibility of those that work in special education, and not necessarily to the whole class teacher. Now, the class teacher is really the primary person in the education of any child, and recent OECD research would suggest that the best outcome for children in terms of education is access to a quality teacher and that's the very same for children with special educational needs. So the primary class teacher or the secondary class teacher has that responsibility and the special education team or supports that are there will support the class teacher in the delivery of that education. But ultimately they need to work together and the concept of a whole school approach really was challenging how schools are introducing and implementing inclusive education within schools. So it's not just about one particular type of person with a specific skill set, it's about looking at the whole school and their uh, responsibility for ensuring that children feel that they're part of a school environment and accessing the curriculum, social um, activities as well in the same way that all children in the classroom are there. And some of the um, academic writers at the time would have made reference to this about us making sure that all children have a sense of belonging in the classroom. Now, what this slide shows, apart from how poor my <laughs> artistic skills are, is in Ireland, I have spoken to too many teachers, resource teachers and learning support teachers who say that working in that post can be a very lonely position that they feel very much separated from the whole school staff, uh, that they feel sole responsibility for children with special educational needs. And there's a lot of resource teachers or learning support teachers that would make that claim. And essentially what you can have sometimes is the children will be integrated or included within the school, but they may not be fully act accessing all of the services within the school or the curriculum that's available to them. And by rights, the pupil with special educational need is supposed to be accessing the services of all. I mentioned before about the class teacher being the primary person of responsibility for all children, including children with special needs. So essentially what you should be having is rather than the two arrows at the bottom going either way, you should also have just one box at the top where the whole school and all the staff within it are the responsibility in looking after the needs of children with special educational needs in the classroom. Okay, so one of the roles that we would have in the National Council for Special Education is to provide, to conduct research, independent research in the area of special education, but also to provide guidance, information to stakeholders and policy advice to the Minister for Education and Skills. 
And one of the pieces of guidance that we developed is what I'm going to talk to you about today, and it's this resource pack that I mentioned that we have developed for schools to support them in including children with special educational needs at a whole school level. Now, they're quite heavy, so I wasn't able to bring along one for everybody in the audience today. I have two here which I can just circulate if people would like to have a look and flick through, feel free, uh, during the session. It's available on our website, and if people would like copies, feel more than free to ring the head office and ask for a copy of our framework. Um, so what is the tool? Well, as you flick down through it, you'll see it really is just a guidance document. It's a resource pack to, sc to schools that outlines what good practice should look like for including <coughs> children with special educational needs. It also is a tool that will help schools to rate their levels and quality of inclusion. So that really gets down to issues of true inclusion. And it allows schools the opportunities to identify what they're doing well. I think in Ireland we tend to always think of what we're not doing well and areas that we need to make improvement in. But in order to give yourself a true assessment of how you're actually achieving in terms of uh, inclusive education, you need to look at the good practices first. And actually when we were testing and piloting this tool, Lots of the schools said to us, we actually had no idea just how well we were doing or how much we were doing till we sat down as a team and we started to write down out all of the things that were perhaps happening maybe informally, but this prompted them then to look at them in a more formal capacity. Clearly, once you do that and you know exactly what you're doing first, then you can look at what areas uh, you need to address in order to make some improvements. We have a rating scale that's in there. And we went down the road of not having a quantitative rating scale. You'll see it a little bit later. Because we certainly felt that schools, if they're working in teams and they're building up consensus view as to how they're performing in relation to inclusion, when you're getting down to 0.5 percentages or even 1 percentages, uh, I think it makes it very difficult for schools to make a decision around how they're doing. So we have a, a qualitative measurement scale. So it's quite a simplistic one, which I'll show you about later. And it essentially goes from you know, getting there to doing very, very well. So it's a non-threatening indicative tool of, of the level of quality a school will, will, will um, rate themselves for in terms of inclusion. But if you identify areas for improvement, of course, you can't just leave it there. You have to then address those issues. And we would say to schools to, you know, take a small number of areas and work towards implementing plans for improvement. We've developed uh, some interactive tools that the schools can use. In the back of that framework that's circulating around, we have a CD-ROM, and it's also available on our website, um, where schools can actually upload materials, write down what they're doing well, rate themselves, all through interactive tools. So we've tried to make it as user-friendly as possible um, in that regard, and it means as well that it's not just a paper exercise. They can come and they can go back to it. It's a long process for the first time for a school to engage in it, so it's important that they have a formal record um, of it in, at, at a school level. So just a little bit about how we developed it. Um, we set up an advisory group um, that was uh, made up of the usual education partners, and we also had representation from the NDA on that as well. Uh, we had to look at the literature. In fact, some of where this originally arose from was we had commissioned a literature <coughs> review looking at the principles and practices of inclusive education. And that was a really good starting point because we had very current, up-to-date evidence available. We then also had to look to see um, what types of evidence is available in terms of uh, self-evaluation because we wanted this to be a living document. We didn't just want it to be a good practice do uh, document that schools could refer to. We wanted them to engage with the document. So we needed to look at what other types of quality assurance tools were out there in terms of uh, measuring quality within a school. So that was also the type of literature that, that literature that we engaged in. When we had a reasonably good draft, we went to we recruited ten pilot schools, five post primary, three primary, and two special schools. And that really was where the true learning actually began, was when the schools uh, took it on board. And uh, there were some really, really interesting findings from that. Just to give you an example, we would have had between eight and nine criteria per theme or per standard, which I'll show you in a moment. Initially, in the school said, way too much. <laughs> There's not a chance we can get through each of those. You need to pull it back. And that was extremely challenging because this is a, a standard tool to be used by all schools, so in order to make sure it's applicable across the sector, 
we were quite um, concerned that we might have lost some of the important content that was in some of those criteria. So we worked very hard to make sure that we rounded up some of the criteria without losing some of the core content. So now we have on average five to six criteria in each of the standards, which we'll come to in a moment. We then went beyond, apart from having an advisory group, we went to um, the system. I think we wrote to about 100 stakeholders and got about a 50% response rate, which I thought was a very high response rate when it comes to consultation, because I think we're all being consulted to death at the moment and have been over the last number of years. But it showed the real strong will of the system to have such a tool in place that they took the time to read it and to give the feedback. And we did significant tweaking of the final draft based on that. We then began the fun work of designing it and getting it into what we think and hope, you will agree, is a, an accessible and an engaging version of the document, both in hard copy um, and in electronic format. Now, we did publish it late last year, but it's really only slowly uh, rolling out into the schools this year. Towards the end of the last school year, and certainly the beginning of this school year, and I'll explain a little bit about why that is, because we have some of our staff involved in supporting schools to kick-start it off. Our special educational needs organisers are going into schools to provide them with information seminars around it. So I'll tell you about that in a little while. Um, before we get into it, I always like showing to people what our schools found in relation to this process, certainly the pilot schools. I do hope that in a number of years' time we'll evaluate it formally with the schools who have engaged in full cycles of the framework to get their feedback on it. It will no doubt require tweaking at that particular point, but we want to see how effective this is. Have schools found it useful and helpful in uh, supporting a whole school approach to inclusion? And we were very happy to see that the, the strongest and most consistent feedback that we got from schools was that they said, to quote their own words, it opened up special education to the whole school. Um, and that to us really validated the whole principle and philosophy behind it. Schools felt that uh, up until they actually tested the framework, that sense of the lonely special educational needs team working together and being primar primarily responsible for the education of children with special educational needs really was dispelled and the whole school got involved in the process and the whole school realised and understood their responsibility in terms of ensuring inclusion right across the board. Uh, a couple of other points there, just in terms of giving us validation we were on the right track, uh, that there was a strong pupil well-being focus, the concept of inclusion was good, the measurement scale was supportive. Um, I'd mentioned before the qualitative one, and they, we got quite a few comments to say that they were glad it wasn't a quantitative one. So we think we have uh, responded to the needs of the schools um, in, in relation to it. I mean, we've got plenty of critical feedback as well, but it was all constructive uh, feedback, which we really replied to. Uh, some of it, as I said, by reducing the number of criteria. Others, they said that the length of time to engage in it was too short, so we've extended that as well. So we really listened to the feedback that we got back um, from our pilots in particular. What I've sent around there just as a sample, um, because I didn't want to put it up in the actual slide because it would be just too impossible to see, is what the actual framework looks like itself. So this is uh, just a sample, um, a handout of one of the actual themes that we have in it. But as you can see, um, we have 10 themes and a number of them have sub-themes. But it covers all things because it's a whole school approach. It covers everything from leadership right through to curriculum planning and implementation and recognition of learning. We then have a simple uh, theme description that says, right, this is what it's about. Uh, it's, it's almost like the standard goal that outlines um, a brief paragraph or a summary of what the standard or what the actual theme is hoping to achieve within a school. And then the criteria that we spoke about, um, or uh, in other systems they're called indicators, um, are, are, there's about five or six of them underneath each, each of the themes. Um, lastly then, and this again was one of the feedback we got from the pilots, they said, give us some examples. The pilot schools told us it was a bit dead. They couldn't visualise what it actually would look like in a school because it was all around statements, it was all around standards, it was all around indicators. So um, in the version that we've sent out there, we've given examples um, of what it would look like. 
So we take it at either maybe a whole school level, looking at it from the principal's perspective, looking at it from a teacher's perspective, and several examples looking at it from the pupil's perspective. Just to give a little bit of life to the document as well, and we try to use uh, what we believe to be kind of user-friendly and uh, accessible language that schools would be used to. There are the themes themselves. Uh, a number of these themes, as I say, have a few sub-themes within it. So leadership and management, of course, Every uh, institute, no matter what it might be, needs to have uh, leaders and management uh, running it. So this looks at what are the good principles around um, for, for leaders to appreciate and understand and implement uh, at management level in, with regards to inclusive education. Whole school development planning really looks at the whole, whole approach to planning inclusion across the board. The environment, are we looking at the accessibility of the environment? And we're not just talking about the physical accessibility, we're also looking at the accessibility of um, uh, other things within the classroom, is the curriculum accessible at a classroom level? What levels of differentiation are schools engaging in to ensure all children are able to engage in and access the curriculum? Communication is very, very important, of course. Uh, verbal communication, written communication across the board, uh, really, really important. The fifth one around pupil and staff well-being is one of the first that's split up into two, so we take them separately, look at the well-being of both the pupils and the staff within the school. Curriculum planning for inclusion is the example I've actually circulated out there. Uh, individual educational planning, because individual education plans as envisaged in the um, Education for Persons and Special Education Needs Act, or the Epson Act, um, haven't been formally introduced yet. Um, we know that they're being introduced and we know that they're being used in lots of schools around the country. It's still best practice. We actually have separate guidelines ourselves in relation to IEPs that we published a few years ago. So it's really, really important that planning happens at that individual level. We then have um, two sub-themes for teaching and learning strategies that looks at different approaches that ensure that teachers are um, fully engaging and using different variety of needs or different variety of uh, technology and activities to engage pupils and then good strategies around how the pupils will learn and engage themselves as well. Classroom management is very, very important and ensuring that pupils with special educational needs that their needs are considered in the context of uh, classroom behaviour and protocols. And lastly then, um, support for and recognition of learning. We cover both the formal recognition of learning and informal recognition of learning that's split up into two as well. So just if you refer to the handout that I've given you there, that just gives you a visual of what it actually looked, looks like. So I've taken the example of curriculum planning for inclusion, which is theme six. So you might just want to take a few moments there to look down through it. This particular theme has five criteria. You can see they're quite simplistic. They're not very, very long lists. We would have had long lists in earlier versions, but we were told to roll that back while at the same time not losing the essence of what's important in terms of ensuring that good planning um, considers children with special educational needs. Our vignette or our example of good practice in this case happens to be Sinead who has a mild general learning disability and Sinead is in post-primary school. She wants to learn Spanish and this gives examples of how um, the teaching and learning strategies can ensure that Sinead engages um, and enjoys learning Spanish while at the same time being responsive to her particular um, needs in this case. So that's just a, a visual. Um, I'll, I'll hold you on page two because I flip over then to the visual to the actual tool that you engage in next. So we have five steps um, to engaging. And we say that the process can take between two and three years for a school to get through. It might seem like a long time, but certainly for the first time, it's definitely the most challenging time for schools to engage in because they're starting from a very, very early basis where they may have limited documentation, they may not have formalised a lot of good practices that are taking place. So the preparation work, I think, in particular for the first time engaging with the framework is the most important for schools. Um, we have a number of self-reflection templates, there's <coughs> essentially self-assessment templates, um, but because we felt that this is very much a, a self-reflective process where schools are looking at themselves, we felt that that was more of an appropriate terminology. We've designed action planning templates as well then that schools can use to support them in implementing uh, the plans that they've identified to address areas for improvement 
they then need to get doing. That's quite simply the implementation. And once you do and once you implement, you need to come back and you need to review how successful that implementation is. Okay, preparation, fairly obvious. You need to get familiar with the framework. You need to let the school know uh, what this is going to involve and get people to start bringing their documentation up to date. I mentioned before about the information seminar. We have trained up all of our special education needs organizers or our CNOs to offer a one to two hour information seminars to schools to help them to become familiar with the document and how to use the actual templates that are in place. And I think that's really important. It just means that rather than the document landing on a principal's desk, which may go over to a shelf never to be referred to again, our CNOs as they're knocking on the doors are reminding schools about this framework and offering them an opportunity to engage with them on it to support them in using the process. We also offer a participation certificate to schools. So they can publish this on their website, they can have it up in the reception area as a mark or a demonstration of commitment to inclusive education. So as soon as they formally sign up, they'll get a participation certificate. It's not a tick mark to say that they have done it and they've scored X or Y mark. It's purely to demonstrate that they're participating in the process because remember, this is a self reflective process within the school. We don't formally evaluate or validate what the schools have, um, have suggested with regards to how inclusive that they are. The templates that we've designed then are also in the handouts which I've given you there. Uh, we just try to make it as user friendly for schools um, as possible. They can do it via paper or they can do it via the electronic one. And that's the qualitative measurement scale that I mentioned to you before. Uh, quite simple, not rocket science. Um, and I think it's easier for people to have rows about whether they're here or here as opposed to whether they're between 25% and 50%. I think it makes it that bit easier. Um, they then need to identify priorities for actions and we have in the template here a place where they can identify those and they can also then outline their action plans. We've designed templates for them, so it's entirely up to themselves whether they use those templates. There's a lot of them floating around from school development planning and other areas, but we have designed them. And in doing so, they need to identify their actions, responsibilities, timelines in the usual planning process. They need to get doing, and that's the tough bit. Um, and then they need to review. Once they've actually engaged in the process, they need to review. But we will be encouraging schools to engage in this process on an ongoing basis. Once they've gone through one cycle of the framework, we'd say go back to it again. Second time around is going to be so much easier because they're just building on the benchmark from the previous and their first engagement in it. We also have uh, provided an overall school inclusive measurement mark and essentially it's just totting up the totals from all of the framework, from, sorry, from all of the themes within the framework so that the school can say on a qualitative scale where they are overall rather than just looking in between each of them. And lastly then I'll just leave you with a, a very old Native American saying which I think just describes really the essence of what this framework is doing and how important it is for everybody to be involved in the process. If you just have small pockets of staff being involved, they're not really going to understand no matter how much you tell them or no matter how much you show them. They need to be involved in the process to feel that sense of ownership in the way that all staff, we would suggest in a whole school approach, should feel when it comes to including children with special educational needs. And I know my time is just up, so thank you Shane. Yeah, thank you. I'll take questions.